Well, good morning to you all. We can go ahead and get started on time here. Wanted to just say we really appreciate your prayers on our, our behalf for our family, for Tommy and her family. We really, we really feel it and are thankful to you. Well, let's go to the Lord and ask him to bless our study here. Our gracious God, you who are sovereign over all things, we are thankful that we have your word with us now. We ask you to bless us, teach us. I pray that, Lord, you would give your word success, spirit of holiness, on us descend. Minister to each of us through the power of your living word. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, I'm going to read the first six verses today. And then our focus will be on verse 4, on the faith of Abel. Hebrews 11, verse 1. He says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up, so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Amen. So, we're at the point of this letter where he's really honing in on the subject of faith. Faith is the subject. We're going to see that in these people's lives. By faith, by faith. And last time I talked about and kind of defined faith as being like the spiritual eyes that really see these divine realities. Or it's, it, faith operates like the spiritual hands that really lay hold of these realities. And it's also the power. Faith operates as a power, a power source and a power that enables us to proceed, to proceed forward in this pilgrimage, to keep going forward. And it can be through hard things or it can be just normal day-to-day -day mundane things, but there's the onward, forward progressing that's empowered by faith. And as I thought about it, uh, more this week, I, you know, I told those at prayer meeting, I, I feel like some verses will just yield fruitfully and easily and liberally, but some verses kick. They give a little resistance, and I felt like verse 1 was that much that way, 1 through 3, that how do we really understand this? And so I wanted just to take a few minutes before I get into Abel to help define a little bit further and clarify maybe some of what he's talking about here, about faith. And I'm persuaded at this point that some of the modern translations that use assurance and conviction that might be a little bit too much on the subjective side. You know what I mean by that? There's subjective terms and there's objective terms. Subjective leaves it a little bit more loose. Kind of, what do you think? How do you feel? What are your thoughts about it? It's very subjective. And then objective is, boom, this is, this, this is the thing. This is how it is. This, this is an objective statement. So if you have some of the older translations, like the King James, New King James, it, you, you're going to read it saying something a little bit different. It does put it more objectively. For example, the King James says, Faith is the substance 
of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There is, a, there is a modern translation that does use the objective terms. It would be the Christian Standard Version or Christian Standard Bible, CSB. And it says, faith is the reality of things hoped for, the proof of things not seen. So to me, the more objective sense is best, and it seems right, and especially what helps me here is verse 3. Because I think verse 3 is providing an illustration or even an example about what he's saying in verse 1. So he's talking about the creation of the world, isn't he? So let's think of the illustration both ways. Look at verse 3. He says in verse 3, By faith we understand that the universe, or the world, the worlds, was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Okay, so if faith... If faith is the conviction of things not seen, verse 3's example, you just take the word faith and replace it with the word conviction. Faith is conviction. So it would read like, by conviction we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Now to me that feels like a little bit of a circular argument. God created the universe and the world by his word. How do you know? By conviction. I have conviction about it. See, that, that's, that's, okay, that may be true, but that's still, it's subjective. That's what you think. Let's read, it, let's read it with a more objective sense. If the objective word evidence is used, let's use this word. Verse 3's illustration would say, by evidence we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Now, I think that is illustrating the point about what faith actually is and what he's trying to get across. Verse 1 says, faith is the evidence of things not seen. And verse 3 says that faith understands that the world, what is seen, was made out of what is not seen, the Word of God. So we weren't, you know, we, none of us were there on the day of creation, were we? None of us. And the thing is, if you were there, that wouldn't help you anyway. You'd, it, we would still understand it by faith. I imagine God and Adam talked a lot, didn't they? They walked in the evening or in the cool of the day and they communed. So it was even Adam believing God that you're the one who created all of this. And you did it by your word. So he's saying we have evidence of an unseen reality not just conviction it is also conviction that's true right but it's more than conviction the seen and felt world that we live in is evidence or proof of an unseen God that's why Calvin could say things like we see sparks of his glory in everything that he made we see his fingerprints on all of creation and Romans 1:20 says where Paul says for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature these are invisible not visible to the to the naked eye but they have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so they are without excuse others like the psalms say the heavens declare it the heavens which are creation the stars all of they're declaring that, that God is glorious, that God, the, about the glory of God. So by faith, the people of old received their commendation from God. So that's what verse 2 is talking about. Verse 2 is a powerful and brief way of saying that faith is the only way of being accepted or commended by God. It's the only way, and it has always been this way, even from the very first family in creation until now. Okay, so now the author gets into this first example of someone commended by faith or commended by God for their faith, namely Abel. So today I'll speak to you about the faith of Abel. Now, we need to consider likely Abel never saw God like his dad, like Adam did. Because after the fall and they were cast out of the garden, God stopped appearing to man like that. Why? 
Because a fallen man can't behold the glory of God and live, right? So Adam, I mean Abel, would be the first person to actually relate to God solely by faith. So at this point, we need to turn to Genesis. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. And we'll look at the story of Cain and Abel together to get it before us. Ten verses, verses, Genesis 4, verses 1 through 10. Now Adam knew his wife, sorry, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. All right, we'll stop there. But now that we have the story from Genesis fresh in our minds, I want us to consider that, that narrative along with what we have here now in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. And for us to really hear what the Lord is saying to us. That's what we need. That's what we want. We want the mind of the Lord. We want to understand what God is saying. We need to learn to listen to God and what he's saying to us. So the first thing we see in this verse, this one verse, is that Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. All right, if you're taking notes, this would be point one. This would be the first thing. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. And the key to this is the fact that Abel did it by faith. That is the key. With the, the Puritans would say with hard texts and difficult texts, or even many texts, the, the, if you want to unlock it and get the meaning, the key is at the door, so to speak. So the key is it's by faith. Remember, faith does not take some blind leap into the dark. It does not do that. That's presumption. It, it, it doesn't operate or thrive on assumptions either. Faith won't thrive on assumptions. No, faith operates or sees. It really sees and really lays hold of these divine realities. Those divine realities are real. Faith's not what makes them real. They're real. But faith is what sees and lays hold of these real truths, these divine truths. Faith operates by a command and a promise. Those are things on which faith thrives. So it operates upon what has been revealed by God. That's what activates faith. If it's not as though Cain and Abel were there and saying something like, hey, we need to go worship God. You bring what you think and I'll bring what I think. And they're just thinking up whatever they th thought might be presentable. And, and Cain decides to bring the grains and fruits, and Abel decides to bring the fatling and the calf. It does not operate that way. That would, that would talk about their, their presumption, their problem-solving skills, or their intuition, or something along those lines. But it would not be operating by faith. I believe it's very safe to say that Abel's faith was not based upon a whim or a guess or an assumption. Right? Remember, 
Cain and Abel were both under the curse of their father, Adam. They're, they're no longer in the Garden of Eden in this paradise. They're included with their parents now. That, well, their parents were cast out, and then they, as we read, had these sons out there. So they're, they're both under the curse, too. They both have received their fallen nature from Adam, just like all of us, exactly like us. Cain and Abel would, have, would be just like you and me. And they both had a sin nature, and they both needed to make a sacrifice to God. They're, and they're both apparently adult men who have, who have developed or gone into, gone into their trade or their means of living. Cain became a tiller of the ground, a farmer, so to speak, a, a planter. And Abel became a herdsman, taking care of sheep, goats, cattle, things like that. And Genesis 4 tells us that they both brought their sacrifices or offerings and presented them to the Lord. They both came, they both made this offering or sacrifice to the Lord. And in a way, you could say right there, there's a picture that both were involved in this external act of worship. See, external act of worship. Both were there. And we're told the Lord had regard for Abel and his sacrifice, but for Cain and his offering, he showed no regard. So it's a both and. He had regard for Abel and his sacrifice. So this brings up the question of how they knew for certain. You ever wonder that? How did they really know God accepted Abel's, but he didn't accept Cain's? How could they have known that? Because there is no guesswork about that. It was a settled fact that Abel's was accepted and Cain's was rejected. That wasn't the argument. They knew, but how did they know? I think there's a lot of speculation, right? Anybody know the most common one? The Bible study. The most common? Okay. Well, here's my take. My opinion, take that for what it's worth, is I think the best way to understand it is that fire came down from heaven and consumed Abel's, but it did not come down and consume Cain's. Now, again, the scriptures don't tell us this explicitly, explicitly, but there are other examples in the Bible of that happening, aren't there? I mean, you have that with the high priest Aaron, the very first high priest, and his sacrifice in Leviticus 9, fire came down, consumed it. You also have with uh, Solomon and the inauguration of the temple, uh, and fire came down and consumed that sacrifice. And then there's another one with Elijah. Remember that one? where he's having the competition with the prophets of Baal, where he says, okay, we're going to find out if Baal's the true God or if, or if Yahweh, the Lord, is the true God. You make your sacrifices and I'll make mine and we'll see. And so fire came down on Elijah's, right? But not Baal's. So that's why I think that in I, either way, we don't know for sure. There's a Puritan named John Trapp. You know, heard of John Trapp? Spurgeon said, if you ever need a little spice for your commentaries or you need a little salt and pepper or flavor or flair read John Trapp and he does you know what he says he he takes from an old Jewish myth or a Jewish not myth but maybe a Jewish uh, tradition that said that fire that came down came down in the form of a lion's head and consumed the the lamb or the the sacrifice the fat offerings that were presented so you have the picture of the lion and the lamb and all that now that does add a little flair, adds a little flavor, but we don't know if that's biblical or not. But maybe that'll help you picture it or imagine it, however. But again, it was very clear. God accepted Abel's and not Cain's. We're talking about this being a more acceptable sacrifice. So what made it more acceptable? It was Abel's faith. Told right there, the keys at the door. Faith, that's what made it more acceptable. But what does that mean and how does that work? And how is that compelling to the, the Hebrew audience here? And how does that affect us? Because that's what we want to come away with, isn't it? Again, Abel's operating on faith and not assumption, not presumption. I also believe that faith is directly linked to obedience. Obedience 
Those two go together, faith and obedience. Do you remember what that very important verse in Hebrews, in chapter 5, verse 9? When he's getting into this very central theme of his argument about atoning sacrifice, about the ministry of Christ, the priesthood of Christ, he says, and being made perfect, he, that's Jesus, became the source of eternal salvation to all who, what? Obey him. Now, is that teaching justification by obedience? No. It's teaching that faith is accompanied by obedience. Does that mean perfect obedience every time? No, but it does mean faith is accompanied by obedience. That's why James would say in chapter 2, show me your works, then I'll show you the reality or legitimacy of your faith. So we'll see more on that later, but my understanding is that this is not elevating herdsmen over farmers, nor emphasizing the value factors, like Abel's was more expensive. Or more valuable. No. I think it's a matter of what God revealed is pleasing to him by way of sacrifice. He made it known. Remember what we had just read in chapter 10 about all this blood? In verse 22 of chapter 10 he said, Without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness or remission of sin. So God shed the blood of animals to clothe Adam and Eve right off at the beginning, didn't he? They try to cover themselves, the fig leaves, but that wouldn't do. That's, that's a man, that's, that's your idea. That's your assumption. No, he provided the real covering, and it gave the symbol and the picture of atoning covering and forgiveness. It's a, it's a little bit of a gospel picture right at the beginning of creation with this shedding of these animals' blood to clothe Adam and Eve. And it's a merciful and glorious thing and display by God. And Adam and Eve were given the promise, remember, that, this, that her seed would crush the serpent's head. That was right at the beginning in Genesis 3. So what does that mean? That they knew and understood her seed. In other words, a son from her, from woman, would come and, and crush the serpent, the devil, and his works. He would undo the, the curse. He would be the one who brought in redemption. He would be the one who, who brought in restoration. So they had ever since Adam and Eve this expectation of a coming son. And this is what's been handed down from Adam even. And I, I, I think Adam was redeemed. And I also think he would have been an amazing teacher about God don't you think? I mean, he didn't forget those moments of, of the sweet evenings in the cool of the day with God and the things they must have talked about. And he would have handed these things down to his sons, wouldn't he? Wouldn't you? He didn't just forget all that stuff, but he, he would have been an amazing teacher and he would have communicated things to his sons. He would have told them about the animals that God shed to cover us. Why do we wear animal coverings, Dad? Well, let me tell you why. And on and on and on. So things are handed down. Even before Moses came with the law, I mean, there were a lot of godly people that walked in faith. How? Because they knew. They were told there was a message. And ever since the fall, how does God normally speak to people? It's not face to face like he was with Adam. It, it's, it's through a prophet. It's through another. He gets a spokesman to speak for him to man. And now you've got to take it by faith. Faith, And so there is a sense in which Abel and Cain would have had to receive the gospel or the message or the truth about God from Adam. They would have had to believe their dad. Dads, you teach your kids. There's a reason you teach your kids because that's the way it's always been. And kids, you need to listen to the truth your dad teaches you and believe. And now you operate by faith in a message. What well, God could have he could have directly told Cain and Abel, I'm not going to negate that or neglect that, but I want us to see Abel's operating by faith. Abel had never seen God like his parents have, walking with him in this cool of the evening, beholding the Shekinah glory without sin, having perfect communion with him. So Abel's operating in faith. 
the Apostle Paul tells us, faith comes by what? Hearing. And we, we walk by faith and not by sight. So this is all tying together, I hope you see. And now Abel is bringing his sacrifice to God in obedience to what God has revealed as being pleasing to him. And faith is a key factor. This is the essential and vital thing that speaks, that pleases God. This is why I wanted to at least include verse 6 in my reading today. We'll get it to it later, but he tells us. Verse 6 and 1 kind of operate together like bookends or like a sandwich. With the good, They're holding the stuff in the middle together. He says, faith is the evidence or the... Uh, is, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And he says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those who approach him must be two things. Believe that he exists and he's a rewarder. He's a rewarder. It's a beautiful truth. So faith is the key, but you, can't, you also can't be mechanical about it. That Faith isn't mechanical. You know what I mean by that? You... I, I do think that if, if Cain brought even a first fatling from the flock, his still would have been rejected. Why? Because he wasn't operating in faith. It's just like the Pharisees and the legalists and the, the religious people, they bring exactly what God said. We're obeying, right? Here's your firstling, here's your fatling, here it is, here, time, right time of day, right time of year and all that. But they were rejected too. Why? Because they were, they were operating as though it depended on, salvation depended on works, not faith. That's what Paul says in Romans, in Romans 9, in Romans 9. It's the same thing. That's how Cain operated. It's faith in God that makes the offering acceptable. You all remember, here's a biblical illustration that came to my mind, was the widow's might, the, the, the widow's two pennies. Remember Jesus talking about that? He said, you see what she just put in two pennies. She's put in more than all the others. So let's just say they didn't put in two pennies. They put in 2,000 pennies. So it's not a matter of quantity like that. What was the difference with her? Faith. She was operating in faith. That's what made it valuable. And it, he even says, look, she put in all that she had to live on. Her last two pennies, that is a display of real trust in God right there. That is faith to the full. Are you willing to say, I'll put in my last two pennies and trust God for whatever comes tomorrow? That's faith, see? That's what made it meaningful to Christ, to God. I think you can also say Cain would represent a false religion. He represents false religion. He really does. And there's always, through, from those two boys, those two sons, there have been persecutors and then the faithful. That's just kind of how the world operates, isn't it? False religion, it does not operate from faith and obedience upon God's revealed light and truth. It doesn't. It makes its own up. It just operates by doing your best, bringing from the work of your hands, you invent your own ideas about what God is like and you assume you're living a pleasing life to God and you're under a delusion. This will never bring God's approval or commendation, never. Remember what Isaiah said? He, he was talking about apart from a new heart, you're the be our best of works are like what? Filthy rags, something to be repulsive and discarded and thrown away according to God. And that's talking about the best of human works and human labors. It's the same idea. Apart from faith, they're like filthy rags. Proverbs 15, 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. And we're talking about sacrifice to the Lord. It's an abomination. Well, the second important thing we see that Abel was commended by and commended as righteous before God is, well, I'm sorry, the second thing we see is that he was commended as righteous before God. And I said last time, that is all that matters. 
doesn't matter what your spouse thinks, your best friend, your boss, your laborers. What matters is that God commends you. That's the ultimate great, greatest thing. Abel had that. Now, commend it as righteous. This is a truth that the inspired, the inspired author of Hebrews has been shown. The book of Genesis doesn't say it so explicitly like this, does it? But this is what the story implies. And one thing about the Bible is it does reason with us. And you can draw implications. You can draw inferences. That's why he, it uses words like, come let us reason. Or the, the therefores. And the in order that. Or all these words, all these statements to say God's reasoning with us. And so the author of the Hebrews, by inspiration, saw this. If you want to be accepted by God, and if you desire your, good, your gifts or works to be accepted by God, then it will only and ever be by faith and faith alone. And it has been that way ever since Abel, the very beginning of the creation of the world. You know, these Hebrew, this Hebrew initial first century Hebrew audience, they heard about the new covenant sealed by the blood of Christ and the cross, the Messiah, he's come, and they believed and they need, to, they need to hear that they cannot go back to that old system. Abel did not get his acceptance or commendation by that old system. And neither will they. And neither will we. It's only by faith. By faith. We must have faith in Christ and Christ alone for our peace and acceptance with God. So Abel was commended as, as accepted and Cain wasn't. And faith was the difference. So we see that faith is the only way. Do you want to be right with God? Do you want to have peace with God? Do you want this eternal happiness and joy? Then faith is the way. It's amazing to me to see the grace and patience that God shows to Cain in that narrative we just read. When he sees that his face has fallen... No, God does not accept Cain's sacrifice, but what does he do then? What does he do? He goes to Cain. Talk about mercy. He goes to him, and he says, what's the first question? Why are you angry? Now, that's incredible and noteworthy in my mind. That's God's first question to him. So often, we have frustrated and angry lives because we simply are not operating in faith. See that? When you're angry, that is likely God's first question to you too. Why are you angry? Do you ever stop and just examine your anger and the heart behind that anger? And just, just ask that question. That may, a lot, that may stop a lot of problems right there in its tracks and heartaches and problems. If you can just say, wait a minute, why am I angry? Am I trusting God? Remember Jonah, the prophet Jonah? After the Ninevites repented and were accepted by God, and then he's out there on the top of the hill or whatever, and that plant withers, and then he's angry. What does God say? Do you do well to be angry? See, that's what we need to do. We need to check ourselves with, with that question. That, I think that, that's, just, that's fundamental right there, isn't it? Talking about our fundamentals, that's one of the fundamentals. We we're dealing with anger all the time, but how do we deal with it? You can operate in faith or not. And God is so patient and gracious. Look, in a way, he gives Cain more help and offers him a way forward. It's like a gospel, like here's a way forward. Here's hope for you. And he also gives him a message of warning. Remember, here's the exhortation. Here's the appeal. Here's the way forward. And now here's a warning. This is all love. Warnings are in love, right? He's warning him. <clears throat> He's warning him. He says, you need to be very careful about what? Sin. Sin. You must master it. That's quite a thing. How are you going to do that? It's going to be by faith walking in God's ways of obedience, right? Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. 
trust and obey. But sin is the problem. It lies at the door. Sin is always lying at the door when you, when you do wrong, when you're not walking in God's ways. But it's, it's there. It's out there. It's like a crouching predator waiting to leap on you and master you, devour you. But Cain, what did he do? He hardened his heart in unbelief. That's exactly the warning in Hebrews 3. When, he said, when, when you heard the voice of God, when you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart. He went back to the rebellion at the, at the promised land. But now you could even go all the way back to Cain. Don't harden your heart like Cain. And he rose up and killed his brother in anger. See, disobedience and unbelief go together. Faith and obedience go together. Unbelief is the heart of all disobedience and sin. And this is how false religion and apostates work. And heretics and hypocrites, they are brother killers. You see that? Or you could say they are the killers of the brethren, of Christians. That's just how it is. And the spirit of Cain was in the high priests and the chief elders and Pharisees in Jesus' day. Right? They killed the Lord Jesus Christ. He let himself, right? He gave himself, but that spirit was in them. He's righteous and we hate him and we hate that and we're going to kill him. That's the notion. And it was the anger, this anger, like Cain, that killed the prophets before Jesus. Remember Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. And he said, even, even now, Jesus said, from righteous Abel all the way until that, his day, you, you are those who kill like, like Cain. And he said, Abel was righteous. Jesus called Abel righteous. So apostates and heretics all function this way. They are brother killers. Christians are not brother killers. Right? We are brother lovers, brother encouragers, brother sharpeners, we're brother helpers, you see. It's all the difference in the world. Real Christians are never on the persecuting side, ever. They're usually the ones facing the persecution. So the Hebrew audience knew we've got to realize this. Faith the only thing that's going to carry us forward. Jude talks about that. He talks about Cain, remember, in that little epistle of Jude in verse 11? And he's talking about warning them about those who creep in unawares to guard against it because they're so dangerous, like reefs to a ship. It'll, they'll shipwreck this place. They, they walk, as he said, in the way of Cain. And I, I taught through Jude a few years back, and that that study was devoted exclusively to the way of Cain and it's remarkable just all the ways of Cain think of 1st John 3 12 through 15 this is an amazing passage don't you just love 1st John why don't you love the Bible right that's that's the whole goals we want to love God's word more and more 1st John 3 12 and following here he said we should not be like Cain, who was the, of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother is righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because what? We love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever Hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now that's quite a statement at the end. That present tense aspect. Eternal life abiding in him. If you're, a, if you're having faith in Christ, you have eternal life abiding in you now. It's amazing. Well, this third thing. This would be point three if you're taking notes. This, this third major point is that Abel still speaks. He still speaks. Though he died, he still speaks. You know that word still? Does that mean still? Yeah, it means still. 
2024? Yes. How does he still speak? And to whom does he speak? And we want to understand what the mind of the author is here toward the Hebrews. What's he trying to tell them? How's this encouraging them? And what's he telling us? They need inspiration to press on with Christ and not turn back. Even in the face of persecution and facing more loss, yes, you rejoice at the plundering of your property, okay, but you can't turn back now if things get hotter, if it means even shedding your blood. This is where the story of Abel can help you. Abel still speaks to them and to us, these millenniums and centuries later. Isn't that incredible? He still glorifies God and he still encourages Christians. God used him and is using him by faith. Think he had those plans in mind? No. This is the power of God at work. Martin Luther, the old reformer, that German monk, he didn't stay a monk. He said this about Abel still speaks. He says, this means that he who, when he was actually alive, could not even could not teach even his only brother by his faith and example. Now that he is dead, teaches the whole world. In other words, he is more alive than ever. So great a thing is faith. It is life in God. I love that. That hat tip to our dear brother Martin Luther there. I think... The Hebrew author is saying also, he's pointing to Abel first to show that it's worth it to walk with God even if you suffer for it. It's going to be worth it. And he speaks to God too. Right? Abel speaks to God. Remember Revelation 6? The martyrs are crying out to God for justice. Well, God sees your suffering even when no one else sees it. God sees it. And God knows. And he sees your faith. And God loves justice and he will bring his vengeance against evil. Remember, vengeance is mine. I will repay. You have to trust me. Trust my timing. And God is more than capable of making up for all your suffering or all your loss or all your struggles. The, the Puritans would also say they believe that when we see the glory of Christ in a way we will have wished that we could have suffered more for him. He's so worth it. He's so glorious. Abel had the faith that was quoted in Habakkuk 2. Remember that? But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. He just quoted that at the end of chapter 10. See, this is real faith. Even if things go hard. That was kind of the idea with Habakkuk, wasn't it? Things don't go the way you expect or the way you hope. What are you going to do? You're going to have to trust God. Function in faith. Habakkuk, remember what he said at the end in chapter 3, verse 17 through 19? He said, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the, yield, the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet... That word yet is a display of faith. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He says, God the Lord is my strength. That's faith. You're not looking to your own strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on the high places. So the, the faith of Abel, still speaking, ever since the creation of the world. It's his faith that brought him to heaven. Now, isn't that incredible? We're talking about the very first man to enter heaven. Right? How did he get there? By faith. That's it. Faith and faith alone. And that's the way it will be for the very last person that enters heaven. It's by faith. I used to imagine that Cain, I'll end with this, kind of blindsided or sucker punched Abel out in the field. You know, sort of caught him by surprise where Abel didn't know what hit him, that kind of thing. But after studying this, I'm not so sure that's the case. 
I do wonder if by faith he operated more along the lines of how the Lord Jesus operated and other martyrs like Stephen operated. And maybe he even did the thing that that Jesus told us to do when we are suffering for our faith, which is turn the other cheek. Maybe. But we know this. He died in faith. And his faith still speaks to us today. Abel had faith and preserved his soul. Amen. Next time we'll see Enoch. We have a sufferer who suffered and died for his faith, and we'll have one that had such communion with God, he went straight to heaven. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? But uh, they were both by faith. Father, bless this word to your people. Lord, we love you. Encourage us, build us up in the faith once for all, delivered to the saints. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.